Pretty much anywhere you go, some sort of fishing opportunity exists. Yet, depending on where you're at and who you're with, that opportunity might be perceived drastically different. Sometimes it's a source of entertainment, sometimes it's a source of food. For me and Marcus, we find different fishing cultures fascinating and we love new experiences. So this series is dedicated to exploring the various methods of angling within our home state of Montana and trying to catch as many species as possible. For us, anything goes. On this episode of Anything Goes, we're exploring a reservoir that has more shoreline than any other in the United States. Fort Peck. Home of some of the best warm water fishing in Montana, Fort Peck is a massive 250,000 acre impoundment nestled in central Montana. The body of water absolutely dominates the landscape. Just to drive around it takes over six hours. Now in all that water, there's over 40 different fish species. But the king of them all, walleye. People absolutely love walleye to a level that is really hard for me to comprehend. And one of those people is Randy Newberg. Adventure right there. Okay. Woo! <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I enjoy walleye fishing, but some people really love walleye fishing. Yeah, there he is. Fort Peck is quite the spectacle. It is the largest earthen filled dam in the world. Meaning rather than concrete and steel holding back the water, it's mostly rocks and dirt. If you recall from our last episode, the dam was built as part of FDR's New Deal to help pull America out of the Great Depression. But it's also created a massive new fishery that's been manipulated into a crazy diverse mix of non-native and native fish. As with any reservoir, the years following construction, there is an abundance of nutrients. The newly flooded landscape creates habitat and food that allows everything from phytoplankton and bait fish all the way up the food chain to thrive. With all of the new habitat and the mix of species occupying it, some populations absolutely boom. Big fish eat little fish, and then we have this massive experiment that changes over time. Some species like the native pallid sturgeon completely lose their ability to breed, while other species like the northern pike thrive and eat everything in sight. One thing to keep in mind is the initial boom of nutrients can only last so long. The productivity decreases over time, and us humans also like to occasionally throw new variables into this experiment. I consider myself an opportunistic angler, and I like catching walleye for sure but I'm equally excited about other fish. Smallmouth bass, awesome. Little pike, sign me up. In fact, the thought of hooking into a big old pike gets me more excited than a walleye. It's pretty comical to watch Randy as he gets frustrated by catching smallmouth. This is my first Montana smallie. Trash fish. Get out of here. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and then he'll talk about Pike just being slimers, getting all tangled up in his net, and stealing all of his rigs. It's almost like he has the mindset that if the eyes aren't biting, you might as well pack it up and head home. If there's a bass within three miles, he'll swim over here just to mess you up. I'm hoping that was a walleye. I hate these things. You do? Absolutely. I, I love those things. Look at that. Look at his eyes. Why do you hate him? Because <laughs> he's a wall angler. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to understand the love for walleye fishing, but I'm not going to lie, I just don't get it. Pulling up to any walleye fishery continues to blow my mind. The amount of money that is spent on boats, 
pickups to pull the boats, and all of the gear and tackle inside the boats, it's hard to fathom how much people spend. And then thinking about all the small towns that these people drive through to buy fuel, food, lodging, and any other number of services, the contribution to Montana's small town economy is significant. I hoped having the opportunity to take along with Randy, a hardcore walleye angler, in his super nice boat and see it firsthand that it'll give me some insight into why the species in particular supports a multi-million dollar industry in Montana. It's an interesting moral dilemma whenever we have a damn fishery. We create a new normal that's highly manipulated where a lot of the non-native species are more suited for the new system than the native species are. We feel an obligation to keep the native fish going, but at the same time, it's awfully tempting to fill this new habitat with fun, new fish. Over the years, the state has stocked all sorts of things into Fort Peck, and a culture of anglers evolved that really prefers and lobbies for certain species. In Peck, the biggest player right now, of course, walleye, but a decent amount of attention is also given to lake trout and Chinook salmon and then a little less, but still some attention to smallmouth bass, crappie, and northern pike. None of these fish are native to the system. The demand for walleye is so high, we basically have factories for them in Montana. We call them fish hatcheries, but still. Looking at the state fish stocking records, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks dumped over 22 million new walleye into Fort Peck just this year. Yeah, they're little fingerlings, so survival is probably low, but still, 22 million. Over the years, they've tossed a bunch of different species in. Some species reproduce and expand like crazy on their own. One species that has taken off is Cisco. They were put in here as a prey base in the 80s, and when that prey base does well, you get some chonky walleye, lakers, and salmon, which of course makes anglers very happy. During the heat of the day, it was over 100 degrees. It was calm, the flies were horrible, and the fishing was slow. I'm not gonna lie, it had me hating walleye fishing for a little bit. I just was not having any fun. It had me daydreaming, thinking of colder times, when the lake was frozen. And instead of a boat, we had an ATV. And instead of stubbornly focusing on walleye, we are chasing flags and hoping to get into some big northern pike. It's a totally different game on the hard water. We cruise around on an ATV, setting tip-ups, using steel leaders and dead smelt as bait. Ice fishing peck, you can have six lines out per person at a time. So we set up our tip-ups within glassing distance, jig for anything that'd bite, and waited for our flags to tip. Nope. Oh, yeah, dude. Just a nice, a nice one. I thought it was pretty interesting how lazy these big predatory fish are. We would jig all day and never once hooked into a northern. They didn't like an active presentation. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh my god, it's going crazy. <laughs> the only thing they would eat was dead smell, which looked pretty similar to the Cisco prey base we talked about earlier. <laughs> oh yeah, oh boy. Nice, Marcus. That's my biggest pike I've ever caught by a white. And I don't care who you are. When you see a flay go up and you run over and the spool is running out, it's exhilarating. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh, oh my God. Easy, easy, easy. Oh my gosh! <laughs> that is it. Oh! <laughs> 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 
<laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> that's the that's the, besides the paddlefish, like that's the biggest fish I've ever caught. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> We had a blast catching those northerns. We even ended up with a small walleye and a catfish through the ice, which I thought was pretty cool. I felt really accomplished after our days on the ice, and we were going home with plenty of fillets. I was proud. But then we talked to a guy at the marina, and we were feeling pretty good about our success, only to find out he didn't give two shits about our crappie or pipe. The only thing he cared about was how many walleye we caught. And when we said we just caught one small one, you could sense the disappointment. So what I viewed as my best ice fishing trip ever was chalked up as a failure because the walleye fishing wasn't good. Back on the boat, it's 107 degrees. The bite is non-existent and we're still chasing walleye. I will say over the course of this trip, it has been intriguing to learn about the effort that Randy has put into walleye fishing. It's not just the investment of all that fancy equipment and tackle, but how to use that gear as well. The effort he's put into understanding the ecology of walleye, where they will be at certain times of the year and certain times of the day, how they will be behaving depending on what the temperature and weather are doing, adapting to different styles of fishing and seeing what works, and utilizing all of that equipment and knowledge together to put that piece of tackle or bait exactly at the right depth, the right speed, and in the right habitat that he thinks those walleye will be in. It's an incredible amount of time, effort, and troubleshooting that Randy has put in to be in the position that he is. Something I noticed from most of the walleye guys that I hang out with is the tug is not the drug. The drug is getting as many of these tasty fish into the boat as you can. That's a keeper. Woo! Let's go. Another big appeal for the walleye angler is just figuring these fish out. They're super finicky. There's three main ways that guys get them. Trolling, bottom bouncing, and jigging. Fairly hooked in the bottom lip. Whoa! Look at that. We got ourselves about a 16 inch right there. Okay. Woo! <laughs> All these methods are super effective for getting as many fish in the boat as possible, but in my opinion, they're also super boring. I can't believe that fish wouldn't take that. <laughs> Randy. Forget that it's a walleye and walleye just don't fight. <laughs> oh, there's a fish on here. Huh. We spent a lot of time trying each tactic and the one that we found most effective was bottom bouncing. Bottom bouncing is basically, well, here's Randy to explain. The idea with the bottom bouncer is you got the weight on here, your lure and your har crawler harness or whatever you want is back here. So your line goes up here to your rod. So this taps the bottom and when it does, it goes like this and then it breaks three and it shoots forward. And then it kind of comes to a stop and it breaks three and it shoots forward. If you have it the right depth, you don't want to have all that weight there and so much line out that the bottom bouncer is just dragging like a great big heavy sinker. It imparts a lot of action on the bait and on the, the spinner without having to continually hold it. Oh. Yeah, I'm rolling. There we go. <laughs> that's, a, that's a little bit. Get that, get that doodah over here, Marcus. We got a fish. Not quite 14 inches, but I'm hungry. <laughs> Good 
It's because they're frustrating and because they're difficult to catch that makes it so exciting when you finally do hook into one. Yeah, you gotta catch it. Oh, that's a, that's a bender. Holy cow, Randy. Yeah, this is a serious fish. Yeah, sure. that's a real one. <laughs> you ready with that, Michael? Yeah, yeah. You get the net back there and I'll, I'll steer him. Woohoo! There we go! Nice! <laughs> <laughs> yeah! That one you were looking for, Marcus. <laughs> that is the one right there. Nice. He's going in the pot. Heck yeah. We gotta get some photos of that one. Fort Peck is what it is, and I really enjoy coming here because of the diversity and quality of fishing it provides. It has become a giant fish tank that we have experimented with and created a great recreational opportunity. But there is one big thing that makes me worry. When walleye fishing culture becomes so popular, it can have very serious unintended consequences. People will take it upon themselves to do a little bucket biology and illegally stock walleye into new systems without approval from the state. And I'm talking outside of Fort Peck here. While it could have just been one single individual who dumps a bucket of walleye into a lake, if and when those fish become established, groups of anglers begin to lobby to keep them there. And one might think, this is a highly manipulated fishery, what does it matter if we throw some walleye in there? Not every water body is the same. In some systems, the walleye will eat themselves out of house and home, and over the years, the net result is smaller fish and an overall less productive fishery. We've watched it happen many times, and anglers are furious when it happens. One of the big problems is, is that there is a moment in time when the walleye fishing is phenomenal, but there is no way to maintain that quality over time. Because of reservoirs aging and a lack of an adequate food chain to support a predator that is a walleye, there's no way to keep it in that highly productive state. And what anglers refer to as the good old days was just a blip in time that was never gonna last. Fisheries biologists continue to warn us about this fact, yet anglers are quick to forget and we get excited and lobby for new walleye fisheries that are eventually doomed. For now, Fort Peck is such a monster with so many moving parts, it'll likely continue to be a good fishery for quite some time, or who knows, Maybe in 20 years we'll be talking about the good old days. Only time will tell. Something that I've always been a little embarrassed about is not liking the taste of fish. You know, countless times explaining to your buddies the unknown reason for not liking fish. I don't really know why, but I just don't. But while I was on the menu that night, and it's not like I wasn't going to eat, big dogs gotta eat. I think one of my favorite parts about walleye fishing is eating them. It's an incredibly mild taste that will take on the flavor of whatever you season them with. And I'll give it to Randy. Those walleye he fried up were super tasty. They gusta? What? One thing's for sure. After this trip, I'm definitely going to be bringing home my walleye fillets in the future. Yeah, I mean, I like it now, guys. I like fish now. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I really like when my boss cleans it for me and cooks it too. The most excited I've been all day. Oh my god, grab my line with his foot. <laughs>